Welcome to Cal TV News' third episode of Off Script, where reporters share behind the scenes stories from in the field. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tomas Manglonia. And so today we have a full studio. We are talking with uh, Blake Johnson, Anna Luck, Robert Chuk, and Lisa Kim about the stories they produced in the past few weeks. And so let's get started with Robert Chuk. Robert, in your recent story, uh, which we actually collaborated on, we spoke with athletes uh, and students um, who are avid athlete, uh, athletic game watchers about the issue of kneeling on the field. Um, can you tell us about how you went about making that story and what uh, the people you spoke with said? Hey, Tomas, thank you for having me on here. Basically, the whole point of the NCAA story was to really highlight kind of the movement going on in the NFL. A lot of students on campus watch football every Sunday, every Monday. Um, and you see it in the news. You see on Facebook that uh, Colin Kaepernick of the formerly of the San Francisco 49ers uh, put his knee down on the field. And he did it as a protest and that was very eventual and gradual and soon players started doing it too. The big question is whether or not collegiate athletes athletes at UC Berkeley and the Pac-12 and the rest of the NCAA, whether or not they're allowed to, you know, take a knee if they want to during the national anthem. We spoke to the uh, communications office, Herb Benson. Um, you know, we wanted to speak to Catholics, really kind of gauge, you know, if there are any uh, bylaws or protocol for the national anthem. Herb responded in an email. Um, told us to kind of Google it, told us, you know, a lot of it was accessible online. So it was a little bit frustrating that even uh, we ourselves as students can inquire within the communications office of Cal Athletics. Um, but sure enough, you know, we sent us information, we watched the videos, we did our research, uh, and we found out that, you know, football players at UC Berkeley, you know, say in the tunnel, um, a lot of athletes, um, have been addressed by their coaches on kneeling, and it's kind of um, no one's really done it yet. Right, and yet so it's, you're right, and so for the viewers who um, you know don't know what TV programming is like within the Pac-12, the anthem is played during commercial break, and then by the time the camera goes live, the athletes are out of the tunnel and in the field. And so one of the other things I remember from that story, speaking to other students, one of the things that was one of the most important things the students said was that these athletes aren't just athletes. They're students, they're citizens of America, and therefore they should have the right to protest. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, these are college students that are very aware of social issues that are happening across not only campuses and cities, very close to home for all of them. Uh, these are also students that um, have a lot of, uh, you know, heart, and they want to practice their freedom of expression, you know, their freedom of speech. And a lot of the students that we spoke to agree. All right, thank you so much. And again, after this uh, live episode ends, we're going to be posting all the links to these stories um, in the description. And so let's move on to uh, reporter Lisa Kim. I'm actually accompanying you on this live stream. The Polish story will be out very soon in, uh, at the end of the week. Um, can you tell us what you covered and also what you saw at the live protests that many people were asking for Berkeley to ban meat entirely? Um, first of all, thank you for being my son. Yeah. And then that event was on Saturday at noon, and I would say 100 people gathered, and there a lot of them were students and actually people from the online community, and three organizations gathered that day. It was Direct Action Everywhere, the Save Movement, and PETA, and these three organizations gathered to say one message, to ban me on Berkeley, and I spoke with Cassie Kim that day, and she is currently a sophomore at, uh, at UC Berkeley. And she said she's been part of Direct Action Everywhere since her freshman year, and she's an English major. And she's just, like, she spoke, she did a speech that day, she spoke for about three minutes. And she was very passionate about what Direct Action Everywhere does. So Direct Action Everywhere does something called Open Risk and Rescue. And something unique about Open Risk Rescue is that they go into these, where, these slaughterhouses and they rescue a lot of animals, and they do this all live. And so the most recent rescue that they did was they, re they went into a chicken warehouse, a slaughterhouse, and they, they managed to rescue two chickens there. And actually on Sunday after the event, they went to Oakland and they saved about like a thousand rabbits 
because they saw that like rabbits were dying inside a slaughterhouse and they went there and this was all live and it's also on their Facebook page too. Interesting and so how many people showed up to this protest and was there a big police presence? I mean I know we just came off yeah. with what seems to be a while ago but it was free speech week not too long ago where we had police presence on campus. Was it a similar atmosphere? How would you describe it? So the protest on Saturday, I would say um, almost like 100 people showed up. And a lot of the, a lot of people were students, I would say. And that day there was a lot of parents and visiting students, I would say, like seeing, just looking around the campus. And it was, there was not a lot of police security. I would say there was roughly about like five police at the event. And when I saw the footage of the protest when those three organizations went to Oakland, and I would say there was more police there. It was a lot bigger and they were all riding and standing around the White House and they were just like, they were taking action. There, there was a lot of speakers at that event on Sunday too and on Saturday as well. Right, definitely. Thanks for covering that. And like I said, we do have the live stream on our Facebook page and the full story. And you actually interview Cassie, um, who, who led the protest on on uh, Saturday, on Sunday rather, um, and so that will all be on our Facebook page. And it's interesting to see because oftentimes, I mean, this is why we have off script to talk about these stories. Uh, for example, the, the part where, you know, they rescued rabbits in Oakland. I don't know how many people knew that was exactly the case in, in the city. I'm going to move on now to uh, our other reporter, Blake Johnson, who um, worked on a story that hit a lot of people's, um, you know, personal lives. Um, you, you, along with uh, Robert Tuke, uh, spoke to students around campus about the uh, Northern California wildfires. Um, we all see it in the headlines even today. Um, it's, it was devastating. Uh, what was it like talking to the students and what did they tell you off camera? Right, so we interviewed a couple students. Um, a couple of them were actually survivors, like their homes that either burned down or they knew people that burned down. Um, and it's, I can't even begin to describe, I can't even begin to imagine also what they're going through. Um, but it was so fascinating to see how resilient they were. Um, I was talking to one girl and, you know, she was looking at it as more like a learning experience. You know, like, it's like uniting her community now. Although, you know, many of her family, friends, like local residents have all lost their homes and literally lost everything. Um, she was looking at it as like a, it's going to unite the community. And I, I was really like inspired by it because, you know, for someone to look through such a devastating time it's really amazing to see like that people are able to look past you know the, the moment and look at the future and think well it's only going to go up from here. right and something that uh didn't make it into the package was that um a lot of them who were affected are actually organizing in berkeley here and bringing it back home can yeah. you talk a little bit about that yeah so there were a couple um different groups there were some greek life organizations and i think some other organizations that were coming together they were collecting um supplies and primarily they wanted um, money more so because it was difficult to store the supplies once they're delivered to those areas because there's not a lot of places to put um, you know supplies for people because they were running out of room so uh, money would help and it was great to see not only those that were affected by the fires that were uniting but it was also the UC Berkeley campus you know coming together and helping those that they had seen affected um, and wanting to help them. Right and I think one of the most interesting parts of the piece was that you guys actually explained <coughs> the N95 mask and so it, you know it's it's recent um, it seemed like it was a perennial fog that we had on campus um, after the, the fires hit and so could you touch on that a little bit and how that also impacted some students health? Yeah so um, we talked about the N95 masks which uh, because the smoke from the North Bay fires came and affected UC Berkeley and a lot of the Bay Area um, and so many people were taking precautions through wearing these masks um, and we interviewed a couple people, and one girl, you know, she said she had asthma, and it was affecting her, but it also was just affecting um, people without health concerns. And so it was, you know, there's so many toxic particles, I would only assume, in the air. And so these masks were, like, preventing from that and showing people's lungs. Definitely. All right. Thanks, Robert and Blake, for um, doing that story uh, very timely. Uh, and lastly, Anna, um, your story will not be out probably in the next week, but we wanted to talk to you because it was probably... Um, aside from our in interview with the chancellor, this is this was another high pro high profile interview. Um, you interviewed the dean of the law school, Chemerinsky. Um, can you tell us how you uh, went about organizing that interview, and what was the main takeaway? If you had to summarize the interview shortly. Um, so for the interview, 
I guess reaching out to the dean of the law school wasn't the hard part. Um, he approved like within five minutes of like emailing him. The hard part was actually like trying to get through to the secretary and like finding a date to do the actual interview. It was delayed first for a week and then after for a month, so I had to wait for a long time. Um, so my interview was basically asking him what being free speech really meant. Um, a lot of the students here, or whenever a controversial speaker comes to campus to speak, they always say that um, they support free speech but not hate speech. So I asked the dean of the law school what free speech actually meant. So just a, a quick summary, um, he said that there was no such thing as hate speech, and you know, even if there was hate speech, it was protected under free speech as long as it doesn't um, hurt anybody. So that was basically um, what the interview was. All right, thank you so much. Interesting, and so that story will be posted uh, later on in the week. Uh, I wanted to thank again Lisa Kim, Robert Took, Anna Luck, and Blake Johnson for all of their hard work, and we thank you for tuning in to the third episode of Off Script, where reporters share behind the scenes stories from in the field. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to stay tuned to Cal TV for this and more in the coming weeks.